Groundhog Day has come and gone. That's one of those weird holidays that we don't really celebrate, but you know the day, it's when the, the little mongrel comes out of his hole and he tells us whether or not we're gonna have an early spring or a long winter. One of my favorite movies is called Groundhog Day. It's a movie from the late 1980s, and I, I love watching it. Bill Murray is the guy. It's sort of, um, sort of a modern classic, Groundhog Day. If you've not seen it, then I'm sorry, I'm gonna give you a spoiler. Uh, it is a story about a guy who gets stuck in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, and uh, he relives the same day over and over again, Groundhog Day. And uh, the point of the film is, is pretty much what would you do if nothing really mattered and you could live over and over and over again every single day, knowing where other people are gonna be, how would you act, what would you do, what kinds of things would you invest your time in? Uh, of course, in the movie, he starts doing whatever feels good to him. Uh, he realizes at one point that, wait, even if I die today, I'm gonna wake up tomorrow in the bed and it's gonna be the same day as it is today. So he just keeps doing things that he likes. He chases down all the pleasures in life, but ultimately it becomes tiresome for him. As you can imagine, it, it would lose its luster at some point. Um, when we see that movie, uh, although the point is, yeah, if you spend all of your time doing pleasurable activities, eventually they will lose their luster. We laugh at it, we think it's a wonderful film, but we really don't take the message too much to heart. And I know that because um, we don't think stuff is tiresome. We don't think that living every day for pleasure is, is something we should avoid or that would get boring after a while. Uh, I can see that when I walk through my neighborhood and I see all the new cars and the new updated houses and uh, I see the toys that people have in their backyard covered with their, their tarps, you know, that special car that they have or the, or the boat that they are looking forward to using when uh, July comes around. We think that the more stuff we have and the more pleasure we seek, the better our lives ultimately are going to be. But there is a question, and, and that is, does a life spent chasing fun, wealth, sex, parties, and houses deliver as advertised? Is Groundhog Day right? Will it get tiresome? Will it not have any meaning? The book of Ecclesiastes actually answers this question in particular. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, really focuses in on that question. What about what about pleasure? Will it satisfy us the way we think it will satisfy us? Like we have everything that we could ever want and we can pleasure ourselves in any way with, with uh, money and, uh, and, and sex and, uh, and houses and all this stuff. Would we be really happy? Well, Ecclesiastes, like I said, answers that question. Um, I have to stop for a second before we get into uh, this sermon. I just have to say, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is uh, really interesting. It's one of those books that doesn't seem like it belongs in the Bible because it's so stark. It's so almost depressing at places. It's a realist's book, and it's basically about uh, a guy who, I'll call him Kohelet because that's the Hebrew word for teacher. Kohelet is um, trying to make sense of the real world and our experience in it. Not the fake world, not the world that we think we want to have or we dream about, but the way things actually are. And so it begins with interesting words. Ecclesiastes 1, 2, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, says Kohelet. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. It's uh, kind of unfortunate that that's the word that is chosen by, by the translators for that, for that word in Hebrew. It's, um, it's probably better translated futile or fleeting. When you say meaningless, it makes it sound like, oh, nothing in the world has any meaning at all. That's not actually the argument of the book. The argument is that nothing in the world is catchable in a way that it will make you happy if you get it. It's like chasing after the wind. If you go and you chase after the wind, you, you, you'll expect as you're chasing it that you'll get it. And when you reach out your hand to grab it, it will just slip through your fingers. 
And you can try and try and try to get it, but what you, you can't get it in a way that will make you truly happy, truly satisfied. It's always going to disappoint you. And that's really what's, what's meant by things are meaningless, things are futile. Things dis they will always disappoint your expectations. Like I said, some people have like a theological allergy to the book of Ecclesiastes because that sounds really negative. And it is on the face of it, but I think you'll find that if you hold to the teaching of this book, it will actually give you joy in this life in a way that you hadn't experienced before. But you can see how, the, how this language plays out in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 5.10, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. It's, it's futile. In other words, we, we expect to eventually have enough money. That if you, if you get enough, you'll finally be happy, but... Kohelet says, nah, you'll always want more. Ecclesiastes 8.14, there, there's something else that's meaningless, that's futile, that occurs on earth. The righteous who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked who get what the righteous deserve, this too, I say, is meaningless. I mean, we expect that if you do good things and act righteously, that you will get righteous you know, things given to you. What goes around comes around, we say. And yet... It seems like the righteous people seem to suffer while the wicked prosper. And they live long lives when the righteous person dies at 36 of some, sign of, some kind of cancer. And we think, what is, what is that about? Well, it's futile. It, it, it's an unfulfilled expectation. We go into life expecting certain things and we get let down so much. That's what Ecclesiastes is about. So here's what I want to do today. I want to look at Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, and I want to, I want to look at it kind of in three steps. First, I want to ask the question, what, what pleasures did Kohelet try? He's going to get specific here. What, what pleasures did he, did he try to find satisfaction in? Second, what answers did Kohelet find? So what's his summary after he tries all this stuff? What conclusion does he come to? And finally, what conclusion should we make from all of this that we, we see here? So what pleasures did Kohelet try? What answers did Kohelet find? And then finally, what conclusion should we make? So here's the first of those. What pleasures did Kohelet try? Verse 1 of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Kohelet says, I, I, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless, fleeting, futile. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? That, that word laughter is actually a word that is used in lots of contexts to talk about like games and, and fun and like, like kind of lowbrow parties, the kind of thing that you would do on a Friday night. Now, you wouldn't get dressed up to it. You just sort of show up and you'd be with your friends and you'd hang out or... You might go to a, a football game and watch it. That's the kind of fun he's talking about when he, when he talks about la the laughter. When he says the word pleasure, that word is used more for um, more, more noble joys. So in our context, like a really great art museum. You get the kind of pleasure that you get when you look at art or you listen to great music or... Uh, or you, you're involved in some, for him, some sort of religious festival. Like it's a more kind of honorable happiness, honorable pleasure. But what Kohelet is saying here is he's saying, look, look, both lowbrow, you know, the Friday night party, and highbrow, the art museum, joys, don't do anything to solve the basic problems of life. I mean, you'd think that they would. Like, what's the point in life is to go and to live, live it up and enjoy this kind of pleasure. For some people, it's the lowbrow. For other people, it's going to be the highbrow stuff. But neither of them are actually going to satisfy. In fact, Groundhog Day 
is an interesting movie because at the end of the movie, I mean, this guy, he keeps experiencing kind of the lowbrow pleasures of his world, right? He, he chases sex, he chases money, he chases, you know, like driving his car off a cliff, crazy experiences all along. But then in the end, he settles for being able to play the piano beautifully or read a, a book of great literature. And the, and the argument in the end of the movie is, hey, don't settle for those those little things, those little, you know, meaningless things, settle for the big stuff like art and music and literature. And yet, and yet Kohelet is saying, yeah, neither of them will work. Neither of them will work. They're, they're, they're madness. And what, what, what do they accomplish? And the understood answer is nothing. Verse three, he said, I tried cheering myself with wine, which is a way that most of us, you know, many people will turn, I mean, not me. But many people will turn to wine when things aren't going well, when they realize that the pleasures of the parties and stuff don't. Maybe, it kind of, maybe I can inebriate a little bit of this, this life, the, real, the realization that I get let down in, in this life. Tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. Look, my mind was still guiding me with wisdom, which means, of course, look, I didn't, I'm not getting sauced here. I have my wits about me because this is a test, as he said in verse one, come now, I'll test you with pleasure. So I'm putting it to the test. I need my wits about me to be able to evaluate whether wine is actually going to help me out here. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. So he, he tries to experiment with really fine alcohol and fine wine. And he says, maybe that will alleviate the pain. Of course, it doesn't. So he moves on to some other stuff. He, he, he says in verse four, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and I planted vineyards. My son and I uh, have this weird habit that we will sit down from time to time while I have my computer kind of working on something on the couch. He'll sit next to me and he'll say, let's look at houses. So we go to this, this um, website called Zillow, which is really popular in the U.S. I think it's started to be popular now here in Canada, where you can see all sorts of real estate all over the place. And we will go to certain sections of the U.S. that we think would be really great to live in, like the mountains in Montana or just outside Denver, Colorado. And we will look for the most expensive house. And man, there are some amazing homes that are for sale, like $20 million homes, or just outside of Los Angeles, $50 million homes, and they, you can see the pictures inside of it. They are unbelievable. They're gorgeous. My, my wife and, and I sometimes will watch those home renovation shows or the, the hey, we're building this house with this, this special couple, this, you know, the, the couple whose show it is, and they will walk through the process of building the different houses. I remember that uh, on one episode, one of the, 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 the wife who is kind of leading up the, the house um, building was walking through the house, and she kept, oh, let me come. She's taking the camera. Oh, let me come and show you my, my dream kitchen. Okay, she had a dream kitchen. Oh, let me show you my, my dream bedroom. And here's my dream bedroom closet. And then she walked down a hallway and said, oh, this is my dream hallway. Which of course I thought was, really? Like you have a dream hallway? People have dream hallways? Like you're in your bed at night and you're thinking, oh if Lord, if I could only have this hallway, then I would be truly happy. But you know, if you've been to those houses. Maybe, maybe you own one, maybe, you, you visited something like a, a, a vineyard in the Okanagan and you're standing there and you're saying, this house is so amazing. It overlooks the Okanagan Valley and it's, there's uh, wine, or sorry, um, vineyards everywhere around it. And you think, can you imagine what it would be like to live here? Can you imagine what it would be like to have the $20 million house, to have your dream hallway? Well, Kohelet's saying, I had it. I built it. Did it satisfy? Mm. Not really. Verse five, I, I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. Gardens uh, were like a kingly thing. 
the way it worked in the ancient world is if you were a really important king, you would build a really great garden so that people would come and visit your garden and they would see how magnificent you were. You can go back in history and read about the gardens Nero built or uh, the hanging gardens of Babylon. In fact, I have a, a, a picture here that is kind of a, an artist's rendition of the hanging gardens of Babylon. Um, this was, was uh, made by the king of Babylon and it, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And yeah, I mean, you and I think now, oh, gardens, but think about it. Think about the, the massive properties, kind of the Downton Abbey property and, and stuff. That's what, that's what he's saying. I, I, I landscaped these colossal gardens, the Bouchard gardens of my day. And they were beautiful and, and magnificent. In fact, the language here, if you look really closely, is um, very Garden of Eden-y. In fact, you, you kind of see it. I, I, I planted, I was a garden, and I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. That's the same language that's used in the Garden of Eden. And so in some ways, Kohelet is saying, listen, I tried to recreate paradise. The way that God created that first garden for people to flourish, I created my own Eden near my massive house with all the vineyards. And I watered it with technological marvels like aqueducts that come from these reservoirs I made. Unparalleled in its beauty and scope. Did it satisfy? Yeah. Verse seven, I, I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. Um, the ability to buy a slave in those days meant you were quite, quite wealthy. In fact, people got into slavery because they ran out of money and they needed to sell themselves into slavery. So the wealthy bought slaves and the slaves were the, largely the poor. There was a, there was a law though. In, if you were a Hebrew slave, every seven years you would gain your freedom just by, just by working that, that, those years. And so if you bought a slave seven years later, the, the, you, that would be over. But all the children who were born while they were in your house, while, while those slaves, you know, the children born to the slaves, actually were your property if you were the slave owner. And so what Kohelet, Kohelet's saying here is, I had so many slaves that they were even having children and they were my permanent slaves. And I could buy men and women. I could do it. I had so much money. I had herds and flocks, which of course in that day were the tools of business, right? That's how you made your money, with, with herds and flocks. So the more you had, the richer you were. So in modern language, it would be like if Kohel were writing today, he'd say, I had a massive company with uh, international offices and an enormous headquarters that I made into like uh, an orb and had gardens coming out. This is Amazon, right? I owned Amazon. I owned Microsoft. So the wealth that he's talking about here is, is Elon Musk wealth. It's Bill Gates wealth. It's Jeff Bezos wealth. I went to uh, a church on one occasion in San Jose, California. That was actually years ago when I was interviewing to be a pastor there. Uh, it didn't end, work, end up working out in the end, but I remember on the weekend that I went there in order to uh, candidate, uh, one of the guys in the, in the church came up to me and he said, hey, uh, what are you doing on Sunday? And of course on Sunday I was like, well, I'm, I'm here <laughs> candidating to be the associate pastor of, of the church. And he said, okay, but if there's a way for you to get off doing that early, why don't you come with me and my son and we'll go out to Pebble Beach and play golf. Now Pebble Beach is one of the most beautiful, amazing golf courses in the world. And so I was a little bit stunned. I said, well, I can't afford Pebble Beach. He said, no, 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 I'll, I'll take care of it. Now I asked a little bit later to someone else, uh, so what does that mean, why, like how can he take care of it? Well, apparently this guy was worth $2 billion. He had just sold his company for $2 billion, built this massive house on the side of the hill, and uh, he had a membership at, at Pebble Beach, and he played there a couple times a week. 
Now, San Jose is a ways away from Pebble Beach in San Francisco. And I was like, oh, that's a long drive. He said, no, no, he's got a helicopter that takes him there. So I was like, okay, wait, I'm going to be able to fly in a helicopter out to Pebble Beach. And I asked the guy, well, I don't have any clubs with me. And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll get you some. What kinds do you like? I said, well, I don't know. I will have to see the ones that rent. No, no, I'll just get them at the store. <laughs> He's going to buy me clubs so I can play golf at Pebble Beach. Unfortunately, I had to stay and try to, try to get the job, which in the end I didn't take. So it's one of those great regrets in my life that I didn't take the helicopter to Pebble Beach and get, my new, get new golf clubs. But this is the kind of wealth we're talking about. When, when Kohelet's talking, listen, you just think about the richest people who have all the stuff, who can fly and play golf whenever they want. That's what I had. Did it satisfy? Eh. I acquired male and female singers, he says. And a harem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. And all this, my wisdom stayed with me, my wisdom staying with me, meaning that I, I, I evaluated all of it. That again, this was a test. So I didn't get so sunk into these things that I lost all my faculties. I, I had my faculties and I was evaluating it as I go. But the things he says here that he evaluates are really interesting, right? He says he, I had singers, male and female singers. Now, listen, they didn't have Spotify or Apple Music in these days. They didn't. They couldn't just turn the radio on and start listening to music and different radio stations that, that suited their preference like, like we do. So if you wanted to have private music that uh, was, was tailored to you, the way to do that is to have your own private choir. And so this is what he had. And I, I mean, it's, this is not real, but I like to think, oh, he would walk into a room and think, ah, I feel like listening to, you know, Welcome to the Jungle now. And he says, choir, hit it, you know. Welcome to the jungle. It's a, anyway, that's crazy wealth and uh, investment in music. He said, I had the best music. I could, I could have it whenever I wanted to. And hey, gentlemen, notice in the passage, he says the delights of a man's heart. He had a harem, which is a collection of all the most beautiful girls that he could find. Do you remember in the book of Esther? Esther is, becomes the queen because she kind of tries out to be the queen as the king is looking for a new queen and he goes and finds all the most beautiful women in the kingdom and he brings them in and he tries each one of them out and then those who don't make it go into his harem. It's a massive group of beautiful women that the king can call on on any time to have them pleasure him. So he had music and he had sex and he had money and he had, in fact, it's important the, the NIV, which is the version that we're looking at here, doesn't really do this as well as some other versions. Um, in Hebrew, the phrase for myself is repeated over and over again in this passage, right? I had, I had me female and si singers for myself and harem for myself and houses for myself. It's just repeated over and over again. So the idea is, man, I did everything for me. But did it satisfy you? Which is where we turn to the second part of this. What answers did he find? So you can see he tried everything. So what did he find? Verse 10 and 11 is the summary. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor. Like I liked my work. And this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, was futile, was fleeting. It was a chasing after the wind. It's like I tried to grab it, but it just escaped. And nothing was gained under the sun. I mean, he's, you can picture him sitting there on the balcony of his massive house overlooking the beautiful valley, gardens everywhere, women surrounding him, right? The palm branches being waved at him while someone feeds him the grapes and he's looking off in the distance and while he should be so excited and happy about having all of these pleasures all around him, he's meh. 
looking off in the distance, wondering, why did I expect so much from all this? Because it hasn't fulfilled for me. The point in all of this is that Kohelet had every earthly thing and it, and it didn't satisfy. What was the point in any of it? No, nothing was gained, he said. This has been the testimony, quite honestly, of many people who have chased down great wealth or riches or pleasures. The most historically wealthy people in the world are actually not the ones who live, to, live today. <laughs> there, there were people in the history of the world that had more of a share of the world's money than, than like guys like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk have today. So a few of them are, are these, and this is what they said about having all that money. This is their comment as they're sitting there on their balcony and looking out after achieving all the stuff. This is the kind of things they said. John D. Rockefeller, who is the, uh, he was the founder of Standard Oil. There was a time in the United States where all of the oil was owned by like one guy. It ended up being split up into different groups, but Standard Oil was the only business around. He was worth, in today's dollars, $400 billion. $400 billion. What is that? Four Elon Musks. He said, I have made many millions, but they've brought me no happiness. W.H. Vanderbilt was a railroad magnet in, in the U.S. In fact, he owned some of the biggest railroads when those, that's the main way that you could travel in, in those days. And he was worth about $6.6 .6 billion in today's, in today's money. He said, the care of $200 million is enough to kill anyone. There's no pleasure in it. John Jacob Astor, who is interesting because he died, he was the richest guy who died on the Titanic in 1912 or 1911 when, when that happened. Um, he was a U.S. real estate baron. He owned all sorts of properties, considered probably one of the richest men in all of New York City at the time. He was worth, in today's dollar, about $2.2 billion. He said, I am the most miserable man on earth. And Henry Ford, which is a name you probably do know, founder of Ford Motor Company, was worth 200 billion U.S. dollars in today's, in today's economy. He says, I was happier when I was doing a mechanic's job. I mean, you can hear their common testimony is, look, we reached the pinnacle and we realized what Kohelet did, that eh, didn't really provide what we, what we thought it would. In fact, it's become harder. You know what's crazy about that is most of the names that I just read, I mean, say for Henry Ford, for example, or maybe Rockefeller, those people you don't even know. I mean, they died, what, 100 years ago, a little bit more? And you, you, don't, you, have no, you know nothing about them. They were the most important, biggest names anywhere, richest people anywhere. And all of that money and all of that pleasure achieved what? Fame? Yes. Remembrance? Well, you don't know them. It's also fleeting. It's also futile. A name you do know is Tom Brady. Uh, he, after his third Super Bowl win, this is back in 2007, I think, he was being interviewed um, on 60 Minutes, and he, he said this in the interview. He said, there's times where I'm not the person I want to be. I'm like, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a, a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I, I reached my goal, my dream, my life. But me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27. And what else is there for me? You know this. Those of you who've lived long enough and bought enough things, you know this. When is the last time that you bought something with great expectation, a house, a car, some pleasure that you invested yourself in and it had lasting significance? I'm not, I'm not saying did it make you happy for a week or two weeks or even a year. I'm saying when's the last time you bought something that made you as happy as you expected it to make you for the long haul? Never. 
because it's also futile. So fleeting. But, you know, we, we still don't really believe Kohelet. We say, okay, what did you find? You found that this, all this stuff didn't provide the satisfaction. Your expectations went unfulfilled. We, but we still think to ourselves, no, I'm willing to continue to try this, <laughs> you know? Like our dreams are filled with all of this stuff. We think rather that whoever says money can't buy happiness doesn't know where to shop. That we certainly can find it in one spot or another. But what Kohelet is doing is he's saying, listen, I, you haven't been where I've been. I've chased all of this down. Trust me, I've been there. It's not what it's all cracked up to be. Some friends actually years ago who came from New Zealand and they got together with us just to see us on their way through uh, the lower mainland here in Vancouver. And uh, they were headed, interestingly enough, to uh, Kamloops. They'd come from New Zealand and they were going to Kamloops. And so when I found that out, I thought, I, I thought, why? And then I said, so why would you go to Kamloops? And they said, oh, we have heard so many great things about Kamloops and how beautiful it is and how wonderful. And she, they started listing some things off about mountain biking and other things. And I got to tell you, man, I've been to Kamloops and it's a lovely town, right? I've been to the, you know, the TRU, Thompson Rivers University. I've been down there in the valley. I, it's a nice it's a nice river, but Kamloops? Like I've been to Kamloops, so I said to them, I don't know if you should expect that much from Kamloops. I mean, it's a nice town, but Kamloops. They should have listened to me. And the reason they should have listened to me is because I've been there. I've come back, been there many times and I've come back. So I'm telling them out of my experience that this is the case. They've not been there, but they think, no, 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 no. We're not going to really listen to you because surely in our experience is going to be different. That's the way we talk to our kids, right? We end up saying things like, hey, listen, don't do these particular things because if you do these particular things, this is what's going to happen in the end. It's not going to go well for you. It's and they're like, well, I don't know. And they kind of look off in the distance and say, yeah, whatever, mom, whatever, dad. And you just want to yell, oh, my goodness. Well, are you going to just believe me or your dumb friends who've never been there? And what Kohelet is saying here is, I've been there. I've been there and come back. And guys, it's Kamloops. It's not going to fulfill all these great Pleasures. You won't find in pleasure, says Kohelet, what you went into pleasure to find. All right, so finally, what, what kind of conclusion should we make from this? You know, one of the great passages in the New Testament is um, Romans 8, verses 19 to 21. I, it's, it, the whole of Romans 8 is phenomenal, but this particular section is really... Interesting. It says, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration. Note that word. The creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And so in the passage, you've got uh, Paul saying, look, there is a grand and glorious future where uh, the entire creation is going to share in the freedom and liberty that the children of God have. They'll be freed from bondage, just as the earth itself will be freed from bondage. He calls that bondage frustration. The earth has been subjected to frustration. Do you know what that word is in Greek? It's the same word in the Greek Old Testament that's used for meaningless. It's the word Kohelet uses. Paul knows that. He's referring to Kohelet. He's basically saying, look, what you read about in Ecclesiastes, that's life in the fallen world. That's what it looks like to be here and now. There is a better day coming. There is a glorious day coming. But here and now, in the real world, it's also fleeting. It's also futile. Here's the point. If we load our frustrating, 
fallen, futile present with expectations that will only be fulfilled in our fabulous future will constantly, constantly be let down. Let me say it again. It's a mouthful. If we load our frustrating, fallen, futile present with expectations that will only be fulfilled in our fabulous future, will constantly be let down. And that's our life. That's what we experience. I mean, we're, most of us are suburban people. The promises of the suburbs are that if you buy enough stuff, you get enough land, you get the right cars, you get the big enough garage to house all the stuff, and you buy the boats, that you'll get to a point in your life that you have everything that you need and your kids will all be happy because happiness comes because they have more stuff. And then you'll be able to insure it all because you have enough money to insure it all. And you'll be able to sit back, relax, and say, my soul is happy. And ultimately, if you're able to keep living, you'll retire and you'll go play golf all the time. And that will satisfy. That's the point, the goal. That's where we're headed. And you will find in that moment that joy will come, says, says our world. But what you've done is you've loaded in present things a weight that they cannot bear. Only heaven can bear that weight. Only Jesus can bear that weight. I went to Las Vegas once. Uh, my wife and I had free tickets on an airplane, and we thought, I don't know, it's warmer there than where we were. So we went to Las Vegas. Didn't like Las Vegas very much. We stayed in a hotel called the New York, New York. Now, when we went there, we read all sorts of things about the New York, New York hotel, and it said, it is so close to New York, you'll be shocked at how close to New York it is. It's amazing New York. Now, I've been to New York a few times. My sister-in-law used to live there. It's a great, great city. It's electric. It's love being in New York. When I got off the plane, we went to our hotel in the sweltering heat of Las Vegas, and I stepped out and walked into the, into the New York, New York hotel. I looked around. I saw what they were trying to do by copying New York, but it was all like paper mache in my mind. It was all a cheap knockoff. And I said to my wife, what? I thought they said this was going to be like New York. And she said to me, you should never expect the knockoff to be the real thing. Look, you, you and I live in a, a world that is under frustration, and basically it's a knockoff. It's a knockoff. There are joys and hopes and, and, and all sorts of things here that we will enjoy forever, right? Food and uh, companionship and swimming and all the physical joys that we currently experience, for the most part, will be in our physical heaven. But we expect heaven to be here on earth now. And we load into all of those pleasures an expectation that they will be heavenly. And they never are. They never are. And so you and I, we live our lives frustrated. We live our lives let down. We live our lives sad. Look, Tim Keller was being interviewed in this last couple of months by a, a couple of other authors. And uh, he, was, he was asked how he's doing. He's, been having, he's had cancer for the last little while. And his death, quite honestly, is impending probably in the next few years. Things have been going well for him. And so the Lord has given him some more time. But cancer, he says, is going is to ultimately take him. And he was reflecting on what it is that cancer has taught him, he and his wife, in this, in this moment. And here's what he said. He said, um, I've learned that we really try to turn this world into heaven. We're trying to make a heaven out of the earth. And as a result of that, we're always unhappy. What happened with my cancer is that we've realized that you can't make heaven out of this earth because it's going to be taken away from us. I mean, all this stuff is going to be taken away from you. It's all so fleeting. You grasp it and chased after that wind, but then it slips through your fingers and you're left like Kohelet sitting there thinking, meh. What happened with my cancer is 
we realize you can't make heaven out of earth because it's going to take me be taken away from us. It jolts you so much into saying, I've got to make heaven my heaven and God my heaven. And here's what's weird. When you make heaven your heaven, the joys of the earth are more poignant than they used to be. See, we enjoy our day more than we ever did. The more we make heaven into the real heaven, the more this world becomes something we're actually enjoying for its own sake instead of trying to make it give us more than it really, it really can. You want to enjoy your life? Don't load your life and the pleasures of it with an expectation that it can't fulfill. Jesus can fulfill that. Heaven can fulfill that. If we load our frustrating, fallen, futile present with expectations that will only be fulfilled in our fabulous future, we'll constantly be let down. Are you let down? Honestly, are you let down? By all the experiences and by all the stuff that you've been chasing, by the bliss that you think you can find. Well, maybe you aren't finding in pleasure what you went into pleasure to find. Let heaven be your heaven. Let Jesus be your joy. Let me pray for us. Father, I'm thankful for, this is an amazing book, Father, and I'm thankful, Father, that it kind of strikes us in a way that maybe others don't. I pray, Lord, that as we continue to study it, that you would prove over and over again that you are the goal of all things and that the eternal joys that you promise us are the thing we should expect to fulfill. And on this side, on this frustrating side of that eternity, I pray, Father, that you'd help us to enjoy the stuff that you give us as a gift, each day, each moment as a gift, but not load it with expectations that it can't fulfill. We're thankful for our Lord Jesus. We're thankful, Father, that he is bringing us to our eternal home where we may be with him forever. We pray in his name.